and welcome to Practical Persuasion. My father-in-law is fond of saying that if he could have any superpower in the world, it would be the power of persuasion. Personally, I don't understand why you would pick that. When you could have flight, or super strength, trans-dimensional teleportation. But, like many father-in-laws, he's not really well known for making good decisions. <laughs> and I've never had the heart to tell him that persuasion is not a superpower. It's actually a practical skill that anyone can master if you understand the fundamentals. And tonight, we'll be going over those fundamentals. My objective is simple. To get everyone in this room to consider attending the 2017 District 48 Fall Conference. Yeah. All right. The conference is in October, and tonight's 12-minute demonstration will be expanded into a 50-minute workshop, where instead of hearing me speak, you'll be the ones speaking. You'll be the ones applying the concepts that we learned tonight to master persuasion as you have it already inside your systems. And in order to start any conversation about persuasion, we all have to start with a definition. Who here can offer me a definition on persuasion? I need a hand. Any brave souls? Ma'am? To try to convince someone else of your idea? Very close. To convince someone to do or believe something. That is the definition of persuasion. Follow with me. To convince someone to do or believe something. Do or believe. Let's take this and boil it down to something easier to understand. Let's call it an urge. <coughs> Doing is an urge, and believing is an urge. And we're going to call doing a hip urge. You shoot from the hips. You do, you can get someone to do something, that's a hip urge. If you can get someone to believe something, it's a heart urge. You react to a hip urge, and you believe a heart urge. And in true Toastmasters fashion, I'm surprised anyone here has allowed this to happen. Our flag needs to be beautified And really, with a flag that beautiful, we really should all take time to pledge the flag. If you would please join me. <laughs> and stop right there. Welcome to your first hip urge. <laughs> <laughs> if Old Glory, my fellow veterans, and Uncle Sam would forgive me, go ahead and please sit down. We're not going to pledge the flag. But I want you to understand the first persuasive appeal. The first persuasive appeal is that of ideology. Ideology gets people to do things without even thinking. All I said was the word pledge, and everyone in this room stood up, faced in the same direction, with relatively the exact same physical posture. You all did exactly what I expected you to do, what I wanted you to do without me asking for it. You were persuaded by a hip urge. Now, I understand that that might have been offensive to some people, that the idea of not pledging the flag is a little bit disrespectful from some people's perspective. And if you think or feel that way, I want to highlight even more the power of ideology. That it is an ideological belief set that got you to stand up and face this flag. I mean no disrespect. I want you to see what it feels like to follow your hip. Now, ideology is the most, the most effective Persuasive appeal. So what's the least effective persuasive appeal? For that, I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer from the audience with a smartphone. Who has one? Another brave soul. Anybody with a smartphone? Jane. <laughs> Jane, come on. Hey, 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 hey. consider it rugged, or would you call it fragile? It'd be fragile. Now, more specifically, the smart glass itself, would you say that is fragile or rugged? I think it's pretty rugged. You think it's pretty rugged? Would you believe me if I told you that the secondary market in cell phone manufacturing for cases and glass covers is so profitable that cell phone manufacturers allow the lie to propagate that these devices are actually fragile? 
that the glass that your cell phone is made out of is tempered to withstand 6,000 pounds of blunt force trauma. 6,000 pounds. That's roughly 600 times the average hammer hitting the average nail. So this cell phone should have no problem with standing. <laughs> 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 the second persuasive appeal is that of coercion. Please have a seat. Thank you for being here. <laughs> coercion is known by many other names: fear, shame, embarrassment. It's a persuasive appeal that is often called blackmail. And it's powerful, just as powerful as ideology. At least one person in the room had a little bit of a startle. Some of you may have also had anxiety rays. But the difference between ideology and fear, or ideology and coercion, is that you can repeat ideology. If I said, let's pledge the flag right now, many of you would stand up again. But if I asked anyone for their cell phone again... <laughs> <laughs> And the reason that coercion is not recommended is because it cannot be easily repeated. History tells the story of people who have tried to coerce their way through persuasive appeals, and it never ends well. So understand that it is one of the four basic fundamentals to persuasion, but it is not recommended. Now let's take a short respite. <laughs> because it's gotten a little bit heavy in the room. I just want to take a moment to thank someone very special to me, my mentor, Brian Schubert. Brian, would you please come up for a second? Sir? <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know, Brian is the president of our club, and he is my mentor. A mentor is supposed to be with you through three speeches. Brian has been my mentor through my competent communicator, into my advanced speeches. He was there every step of the way with me through the competition season in the spring of 2017. And he continues to serve in a powerful leadership and mentorship role for me. I would be lost without my mentor. And I encourage anyone here who doesn't have a mentor to seek one out. And if you are a mentor, thank you for being a mentor. One more time, please, a round of hands. If you see, Brian is going back to his seat over here in the most circuitous and inconvenient route possible. Thank you for being a very persuasive. And that is because of the third persuasive appeal, ego. Do not mistake ego with egotistical. Anyone who knows Brian knows that he is the polar opposite of egotistical. Brian is kind, and he is friendly, and he is non-confrontational. And understanding Brian's ego is what allowed me to persuade him to do something completely illogical and quite inconvenient by going all the way around the room when he could have just gone up the center street here. If you can understand someone's ego, and if you can leverage that into a hip urge, you'll find that they come back again, and again, and again. Because it feels good to have someone recognize your ego and feed it, even though it has nothing to do with being egotistical. We're running out of time, so I want to be cognizant of the fact that many of you donated for this pin right here. It's a staff CIA pin. I used to wear one of these when I walked through the halls of the agency. You do not wear these outside of the agency if you are a secret agent. <laughs> you can all wear this outside. <laughs> and if, if, can I get a show of hands? Who participated in this? There's a lot of tickets in here. Shake it up. Now. Excellent. Yeah, let's shake it up. Let's shake it up. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating. But really, even more, thank you for demonstrating the fourth persuasive appeal, that of reward. Reward is a common persuasive appeal that every one of us understands. Anybody who's donated for a raffle, or who's written their name on a piece of paper, or written the email address of a friend, friend, or family member in order to win and the opportunity for a trip or a car, you understand exactly what it means to be persuaded by the promise of reward. And reward is interesting because it's just the expectation of a reward. You don't actually have to win. You will still buy things. You will still pay for things. You will still give away information just for the promise of a reward. And that's powerful. It's powerful because if you can learn to do that, if you can learn to offer the expectation of an award, then you can start to persuade people as well. Here's our winning ticket, and I will let our Toastmaster read it. 
after this presentation is over. <laughs> Four persuasive appeals, if you remember, say them with me. The first one was ideology. Ideology is how politicians win races. It's how secret agents make spies. It's how Apple sells computers. The second persuasive appeal was coercion, fear, shame, blackmail. The third appeal was ego. Not egotistical, but ego. And the fourth was reward. Not very easy to remember them in that order, but what if we reframe them in action? R-I-C-E, rice. Say it with me, folks, that everybody in the world eats rice. rice. Say it again. Everybody in the world eats rice. Any culture, any sex, any age, any level of education, you can get them to respond to a hip urge if you approach them with one of these core persuasive appeals. It cannot be denied. It has been proven scientifically. This is how professionals do it. You can do it too. And when you go out and practice these four basic fundamentals, and when you see the power of your persuasive <laughs> appeal in real life, remember that there is a fall conference coming. And if you can learn this in 12 minutes, what can you learn in 50 minutes? And if you can get people to shoot from the hip and do things without thinking, imagine what you could do if you had their heart. The world lives off of rice. You do too. Come to the fall conference and learn how to master persuasion. Thank you. Woo!